So, um, welcome back again. Um, well, I made it because I uh, want to make it clear that where we are right now in the journey of the seven weeks of workshop. So the, the, the total goal, I mean the biggest goal we are doing is to develop the global leadership for the next generation. But what we are doing it for this workshop is about to learn and initiate global leadership development in classrooms. And you know, we've already passed about the first session, which is getting to know the session, and now we are in the middle, which is uh, designing part. So the session goal is to design a global leadership class that works in a real classroom. And today, I want you to guys to be able to, at the, end of this at the end of this meeting, to be able to identify the elements of designing a, a, a curriculum in terms of design and policy aspect. So, um, first, Tom is going to lead today's first session. Let me introduce him. Tom is a doctor student in curriculum and teaching science education in Boston University. He holds a science and master in engineering from Brown University and BS in electronic engineering from, this is the world to, uh, I don't know, worse, <laughs> worse. Worcester. Worcester. Worcester Polytechnic Institute. Before embarking on a career change to education, he worked as an engineer on projects ranging from the AI, AIR's package on NASA's Airs. Airs package on NASA's Aqua platform to creating an interface for clothes washers and dryers be assessed via the internet. Wow. <laughs> many, of, many of his past positions also included creating training programs for new technology for in-house engineers and, and customers. And he's also a teaching fellow in School of Education at Boston University. Welcome, Tom. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, so, um, morning, everyone. Um, so talk today about is um, to do some uh, curriculum design and um, implementation. <coughs> um, if I tend to, if I repeat something or say something that seems basic, you know, you have to bear with me because I don't know where anyone's coming from. And because um, we are somewhat limited in time, it takes a little bit too long to do a formative assessment to find out where you guys are, are before moving on. If those terms don't make sense, they will have a couple minutes ago. So if, if you're going to design a curriculum, um, what you want to do is, first thing you want to do is you want to make sure you have a good understanding of the big picture. Um, and you want to um, start by doing a top-down design where you sort of map out what you want to do um, and where you want your students to end up after they finish going through in this case, what we'll do is we'll talk about a course and the lessons, but then it can be extrapolated afterwards. So if we if we look at this from the perspective of a course, um, what we're going to do is um, map out the course. So what is um, you know where are the students coming from and where do you want them to be afterwards? Now I tend to think graphically, so a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you is going to be graphic, um, but I find it, it it helps sometimes to get the point across. Um, and doing a course design is very similar to designing an individual lesson um, where you, you set a series of points and targets that you want to do for that one lesson and you just take it up one level and you do it hierarchically. You use almost the same techniques to design your course as you do it for an individual lesson. And when you do that, it makes it much easier because you're learning one technique instead of two techniques. Um, the important thing when you're designing the overall course is that there's a logical sequence in the order of your lessons or sessions. Um, one of the things that we tend to fall into is when we know a subject is things that may be perfectly obvious to us aren't obvious to someone who doesn't know the topic as well. And if a student can't track where they are in the course as they're going through the course, it's difficult for them to keep up, even if they can understand the individual lessons. What you want them to be able to do is say, okay, I think I see how these, how the sequence goes together, and there's my big picture. That's, that's where I'm trying to get to. They need to understand the, the objective of the course. 
Um, and so when we do this, one of the things that we should do is make sure that um, our sessions are as self-contained as possible. You know, if you have a, if you have a course that has it meets every day, for example, <coughs> you can divide things down and, and split it. But if you have a course, for example, like many of the courses here in SED meet once a week. And to split a topic over two weeks means that the people are going to forget, <coughs> excuse me, um, a lot of what was discussed the week before because they didn't complete, they didn't get a complete mental picture of what the topic was. The next thing that's important is make sure you know the subject. Um, it's somewhat understood, but it's, it's one of the things sometimes when things are understood, you still have to say it. If you're up there leading the classroom, you're the expert in that subject. And so you have to have a good mental model of all the topics that you're going to cover in an individual session or for the course overall. The reason that you need to understand it is because your students may not be starting where you think they're starting. Um, some ways to, to do this that um, really reaches the students is make sure you're current on the topics. Um, even if you just scan the literature before you go into a class session and, and see an article and, and read the article, you can at least mention it um, to, to the students. It may be that um, you know, the students, it's better if you do that and you say, oh, I, I just, I scanned it, I didn't finish it, than if a student brings it up and you're left going like, well, uh, no, I, I haven't looked for it yet. Um, and if you scan that, you know, be, be prepared to like agree or disagree with what the new, the new article may do, may say. It may be good, it may fit with your model, it may not fit with your model, but, you know, be, be prepared to argue it and talk about it to your students. Again, when, when you're talking more, you know, about this would be more like at a college level than if you're teaching a lower grade. But um, sometimes the lower grades, you know, like the, the K-12, um, if they have a parent that does something in it, the kids sometimes know more than some of the teachers. Another thing that helps the students too is if you understand the historical concept of, of the topic that you're discussing, um, and you present some of that information to the students. You don't have to go into it in a lot of detail. You may just put something online for them. But if they can track through and see how the current ideas evolve, their evolution, their building of their mental model can be very similar. And if they think, oh, I think it might be this, and they read that someone else thought it was this, but then later found out it wasn't because of, you know, someone else came up with some other idea, that shows them, that, oh, okay, I'm thinking, I'm gathering the information, I'm doing putting the information together the way other people are putting it together. And they made that leap, so if they made that leap to the next step, I can make that leap. And that's the eventual goal of education, right, is to create self-thinking people. Right? Not someone that's just going to be a computer that's going to crunch numbers um, or um, process things. It, you know, they have to be able to gather information, recognize what's real and relevant, what's not part of it. Um, big picture and then act on um, and it doesn't and even though that's a lot of people say oh, well that's really a science thing it applies to any field okay so the next step is to literally to map out the course you know um, what you want to do is create a map just like a road map um, or a concept map and you know, so you, what you do is you make a list of key points, and then you group those points however is logical for whatever the topic is that you're covering, or the overall concept. Um, and then look to see what the interconnection is between within the topics within a session or a lesson and between the lessons. And again, it, by sketching it out, what that does is that allows you to see, um, you know, to verify to yourself, okay, this makes sense. And then I am being explicit and I'm not skipping steps. Good thing to do is when you do that is bounce that off a colleague. Does this make sense? If they know the topic, they'll look at it. Well, how do you get from here to here? And it may be something that you learned a while ago that's so obvious to you that you know you forget the fact that you have to you may have to teach that to your students because it may not be obvious to them yet. If you don't do that, that's when students get lost and you know 
they don't like that. Um, an added bonus of doing something like this is you can then take the concepts at different points in the course, give them to the students, ask them to group it together. Have them do the concept map to show how everything fits together. That's, that then becomes a feedback for you to see if you're reaching your students. And it becomes an assessment. Um, it's, um, again, it's a science thing, but it, it works for, um, you know, for multiple, um, you know, all different fields. Um, a couple of things that sometimes you have to think about um, is you're doing the, the partitioning and, and sequencing. <coughs> it's, it's very topic dependent and course dependent. So if you're do, teaching a course that, for example, may complement another course, you should probably try and get synchronized with that other course if possible. So if they have a topic that needs to come before your topic, make sure that you know your topic does come after it or vice versa. Um, if you're teaching a course where students um, have to use the knowledge that you give them immediately, sometimes you have to arrange, rearrange the course so it may not be an ideal course. For example, like if we give a course this semester, the students apply it next semester. You would, you would do it ideally in terms of the topics. But if they're applying the course in the same semester you're teaching it, you have to rearrange your topics so that the students can come up to speed more quickly. And this, is, this was something we had a big discussion on with one of the courses that I work with here on the learning system program where we take undergraduate students um, in the sciences, we give them a pedagogy course here in SED, and they're immediately helping to teach the entry-level science courses, like the 100-level bio, physics, chemistry, and engineering courses um, back across the street in CAS. And um, the last year when the program kicked off, we started out talking about the theory of pedagogy and what we're trying to do and everything else. And the students all said, I get up in front of the class and I stand like this, and I don't know what to do. And, you know, so the second semester we tried to say, well, you know, you're supposed to walk around and talk about things and rearrange the course a little bit to, to give them idea, um, ideas of why you're doing the questioning. And it worked. And then this year, the third, um, this semester, the third semester we've taught it, again, we, we've rearranged the whole thing. We looked at the results from the last two semesters, said, here are the things that the students found most helpful. We're going to put those in the first couple of sessions. And this year, um, we didn't get any results from anything from the students except for after the first class. They said, I didn't know what to do because they knew what to do. We told them what to do. Then we got into the theory afterwards, after they, had, after they did some of the practical. And even though that's sort of putting the, the cart before the horse, sometimes it works. Because, okay, you did this. It worked, right? Yeah, okay, so now here is why it worked. And then, then you describe it. And they've already started to form a mental model of what it was they were doing. It makes it much easier to get that to get that theory across to them because they'll have generated questions. Well, I did this, and the students respond like this. I wonder what that, why they did that, or, or I said something in, to the class, and the class just looked at me like uh -huh. a blank look. Right? We've all gotten that, I suppose, right? You know, wh why is that? What do I do to get around that? And um, so you. You know, sometimes um, you just have to say, well, this is how it would work in the ideal world, but we're not in the ideal world, we're in the practical world. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so at this point, um, it's, I misunderstood a little bit, so I put down here like a quick exercise. But if you think of a topic that you would teach, um, say, in a single lesson, Try and imagine how you would map out that that topic. Um, you know, starting from um, you know, imagine it's your first session with the students. Um, you're going to teach something, and you've got some sort of a goal that you're going to get to. Um, you know, and even if in your head you sort of map it out. Um, you know, try and include some of these um, points. Okay, what, you know, where do you want the students to end up at the end of the lesson? What are some of the key points? Um, and what I do is I call those anchor points. So those are the points where the students can understand, they get an understanding, and they're able then to project off to the next point. Um, 
a sub point or topic is is the way of getting from point to point. Um, what's the sequence? What's the relationship? Sometimes you use points back and forth, but um, you know concepts can jump across points. It may be more like like a spider's web or a net than um, a sequence. And so. Um, you know, like I said, I'm fairly graphical, so if, look at this, I tend to think of this as being a target. And in the target, the students are on the outside. And you don't know where they're coming from. They're coming from all over the place because it's the first class. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get them here in the middle. So we're trying to get them to understand some sort of a common concept. Now, what happens a lot of times is, so, sorry, these aren't slides, I didn't realize that until a couple of minutes ago, so um, <laughs> I was like, you know, there's something missing from here. No color, <laughs> just black and white. And I, like, I know I made this. Um, so if you look at this, um, this is something that people tend to do quite often. Is they sit down and they say, here's a sequence of events or a sequence of topics. If I put these together, this will get, this will get to the goal. And it does um, get to the goal, but the problem is, is the students all have to start. Um, sorry, I'm looking at the reflection here, so if I'm missing, um, you have to get the students are all all have to be in this region, roughly, to be able to understand where you're coming from. Um, and by having a linear sequence like this, if we think of this as being three dimensional. presentations this week, so I'm looking at my, um, my presentation one, and um, and so if we um, think of this From the linear perspective, what we end up with in, in three dimensions is think of that goal as being the high point, and that linear line as we go up, you can see how it moves up the sequence here. And what happens is as as you pull people up to understand your points, and you, you're assuming everyone's starting from this location here. As you're pulling people up, you end up having to drag people up. People you don't, you're not able to, to catch and pull up, end up seeing this point that start out possibly simple, getting more and more complex <coughs> in each of your your maps, and that point gets more and more out of reach. So that by the time you get to the top, you're, you're having to pull people up, and then they sort of slide down to the goal. And it's it's something that it's when we're Planning it by planning out that single direction, um, it's very easy to fall into that trap. And you know, you're trying to get them, you're trying to get the class to sit, you know, you're asking them a question, you're trying to get them to give you that one specific answer that you have in your plan. And you're trying to get them to fit your plan. And sometimes it works, but that's that's fairly rare. Most of the time, what you have to do is you have to go off and figure out what the students, you know, where the students are, and where they're going. And so to do that, what we can do is we can alternate and try and make sure that we have at least two paths to get there. We have 30 minutes left. And um, by having the two paths, it makes it a little bit easier because if you notice now, we're, we're starting at two points along that circle, so it means we've got more area where we can grab the students, right? The students are all around the rim of the circle. 
Okay, so students don't have, you know, own, you know, so a student, um, you know, that's um, here, that maybe like opposite from this point, you know, doesn't have to go as far to come around and get this. Now, again, this is this is the way I, I think about it. It's, um, you know, there's other ways of representing this. Um, but if we go back to the other model, see is you know, the model grows um, and by putting in a stagger okay it almost forms like a staircase that students can zigzag up does that make sense And I'll try to make this into an animation, but it wasn't working last night for some reason. I can't quite figure out why. Um, so what you're saying is that um, since students has all the different starting point around the, the biggest circle, and you're trying to get bring all together to a common common concept, but since they are all different, they probably you know comes to they could they come there in a zigzag road, not the straight up that we happen to exactly. think. Okay. Right. And so it's so eventually the students can follow that straight line because mm -hmm. that may be the most logical sense. Mm -hmm. But if you don't want them to parrot that back to you. You want them to understand why that's the that's the optimal path. And they need to be able to figure it out for themselves. And we can get if we continue with um, you know, look, looking at this, eventually we get to get to the point where if we do a spread like this far apart, um, we see that we catch a lot of the students, and when we come back to the Look at how this one works in the model. That is, we can see that the path for the students isn't as steep. And from each one of the points on the path, you can see where the next point is going to be. You know, where, where you're going to make it to the next level. And when you when you can help students look ahead and see where see really what the goal is and how to get there. It makes it easier for them to build up their own mental models of whatever it is that you're trying to present for the job. Um, and it's and so what you what you'd want to do is you don't just want to have that linear line. Again, you want to have you want to spread the topics out a little bit to gather the students in, and that allows you to move to move forward. So the next step is to actually, you know, get into the detail of your lesson. Um, make sure that you you've got the multiple paths, um, and the, you know, the you understand how each path goes. Um, sometimes what can happen is, you know, your ideal path. The students may be at the opposite side of that circle, and if you have multiple paths, you know, starting points to get to your end point. Sometimes you, you throw something out, you're getting a blank response, you say, okay, I'm gonna start from the outside of that circle. You throw that out, you may find that, you know, all of a sudden you've got three quarters of the class just by having that alternate plan. Um, and so you have to be ready to, you know, to abandon your first plan and, you know, adapt the students, whatever the students know. So you wanna use your formative assessment, you know, ask the students questions, you know, don't, get up and lecture like I'm doing right now, so don't do it as, <laughs> as I'm saying. Um, 
you know, and again, when, when the goal is um, is clearly communicated to the students and they can see where you, what you're trying to get to, even if they don't get it in class, if you've communicated the goal to them, you know, they can be talking to another student and say, well, I see how, you know, I see how we got from this point to this point, but how do, they, how do we get from this point to this point? The other student may, may not have gotten the first transition, but may have the second transition. Um, or they can figure it out on, the, on them by themselves after saying, well, I, I just don't understand there's one little section in the middle, but I see the other parts. Um, and by doing the different perspectives, it's, it's actually fairly difficult to do um, the first few times. So you may want to consider doing team teaching with someone. So you, you both have the same topic, and you start with the same constraints. We don't know where the students are coming from. We know this is where the students are going to end up. Let's do it. And sometimes you find out you're both at the same point, and it's easy to discuss, oh, let's make sure we spread it out. But if you're starting from two different perspectives, they can be both perfectly valid, and you talk about it, okay, and then you, you get your plan. You can see how the other, the, the other person's perspective goes, that increases your mental model by saying, oh, here's another path to get there. Um, and some of this, you know, comes back to the like, military doctrine where um, Moltke said, that, you know, no battle plan ever survives contact with the enemy. And same thing with students. You, know, you get up in front of the students, it's not that they're the enemy, but their lack of knowledge is the enemy. And it's... Um, it's one of the most painful things um, working here at SED when we see a student get up in front of their class for the first time and they're going to get the kids on the points that they know is the path to get to the answer. And it's the path with a capital T, capital P, and the answer with a capital T, capital A. Okay? And they're losing sight of the fact that it's, the, it's teaching how the path works and how to figure that out, which is equally as important as the fact. So when you're teaching the lesson, um, again, do, do as I'm saying here and as I'm doing, um, try to balance out with um, univocal and dialogic discourse. So ask questions, get feedback, throw things out to the students um, to find out where they are and how, how they're forming their models. Um, if, if you have time, a good thing to do is um, throw out thinking experiments and you know have them work in groups. What you can do then is you can walk around the groups and you listen to what they're saying and how they're forming things. It allows you to get a better idea of the model of how these students are, are learning and thinking, which then you can then adapt your course on as you're going along. Um, when you're doing that, um, the important thing is to take notes. Um, because the notes, you know, sometimes a student can say something that's just really critical. You don't jot it down five minutes after the course is done. Um, you know, the next day, like, what was it that that student said? I know it was really critical and it helped. So, to are you going to share the, the I, point? Yeah, I, did, I can give you the slides. Okay. Uh, along with the notes and stuff. Um, and so the important thing of having multiple paths, if the students don't get the point, um, you, you, it's almost impossible to corral them and herd them into that point. Find another point, um, and again, this is why you make the multi-path plan at first, for them to understand what, you know, so that you can gather it and say, okay, this is at the same level, it's a bit of a zigzag, you know, and then, you know, get them back to, um, you know, moving towards the goal. And so when you, when you do, when you make your lesson plan, you know, typically what I do is I put it into a file, and at the end of it, um, you know, append the notes from what happened. So I tried this, didn't work with this class. Um, what a lot of people do is they say, oh, this didn't work, and they go back and they rewrite the lesson plan. The next time you teach that class, you're gonna have a whole different group of students, and what you just discarded may actually work. And the thing that you that ended up working for this year's class may not work for the next year's class. Mm -hmm. But by keeping the notes of what ends up working, and when you go back and review your notes, it allows you to say, oh, here's, it, it, it allows you to understand the concept of doing the different paths and how varied those paths may be. And it's, 
obviously, it's, it, it, when, you're, when we're starting out, it's much more difficult, but it's something that as you go back, um, how many here have ever had a teacher that just seems like they, they're able to just you know, corral the class and just keep them all moving along to the topic? We've all had that, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we all try to emulate. And when we get up there and, you know, we see that, like, well, they made it seem so easy. We missed the minor points, like the formative assessment. And we say, like, you know, like, you know why, why, you know, why did they do it? And this is one of the ways that it works, is you know, you're keeping your own um, information. Um, good, another good thing to do is, um, you know, take notes on the results of your formative assessment questions. Um, you know, and write yourself a reflection on what happened. Um, for assessing your students, you now again, even though we said curriculum design, this is how you design the curriculum. You need to know how your students, what your students got out of the class. And so, use as many methods as you can. Um, you know, ask, ask the students to do reflections. Ask them to tell you in their own words, what are they getting out of the course? How do they see these things fit together? You know, don't look for the one answer. Look to see what they're getting, and that shows you what you need to do. And again, these things, you know, I'm just gonna step through here because we're running out of time. Um, be fair and honest with the students. You know, if they're not getting something, say, hey, you guys aren't getting it, I'm trying to find out why. That's why I'm throwing all this stuff out to you. Let's find out where you are. At the end of the course, do a review of the course. Look at your student evaluations, if you did reflections, look at um, test scores, um, look at all your post-session notes, any personal reflections, include student emails, what are the questions of the students asking? Mm -hmm. And write yourself a recommendation as if, you know, take a step back and pretend that, you know, you're evaluating someone else's course. Write yourself um, a recommendation for what to try next year. And then after that, do a summative reflection of here's, here's what I tried, here's what worked, here's what didn't. And what you do is the next year, <coughs> you use that when you start the course to say, you refresh yourself and say, okay, now I know what I tried, what worked, what didn't. Um, and after you've done it a few times, um, one of the things that you can do is you can also do, and I think there's probably another name for this, I make up names if I don't have <coughs> time to do it. Do a personal review. So look at your course reviews, um, and um, just here. Sorry. Oops. Sorry about that. Um, look at your course reviews and look to see: is there something that's occurring in the courses that maybe just something that I'm uncomfortable with? I can't do well. You know, note what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, you know, don't be afraid to ask colleagues, teaching fellows, teaching assistants, um, or whatever to give you some input. Um, it's one of the things that's difficult the first time that, you know, you go through it because you feel like you're being attacked. But what you, um, in the end, you know, what you do is you end up having an open discussion. And a lot of times they'll come back and they'll say, do you mind doing that for me too? You know, can, can we sit down and do it? And um, we've done this a lot within in engineering is you know, we go through and even a successful project, we go through and analyze the project to say what worked, why did it work, can it be made better, um, you know, what didn't work, why didn't it work, how do we fix it, and pre or prevent this from happening in the future. Um, and sometimes it's just certain, certain things that, um, if, for example, you're taking over a course from someone, it may be you're trying to fit their style. Um, you can't do it. You have to. You have to make the course fit you, and so you have, may have to adapt. Um, like in my case, I think very um, visual, visual spatially. But so I do animations and stuff like that, which the animations say are obviously more abstract than concrete. But it's, you know, that that's the way I think. I mean, I, you know, I build up a mental model and where things are in relative position to each other, and I work with it. So. That's a strength. Sometimes people can't see things spatially like that, and so I have to come up with other ways, you know, more verbal ways um, of doing it. And be metacognitive. Um, you know, 
it's the same thing we want our students to be, is think about like, well, what am I trying to do? You know, I'm trying to build a student that can be a self-thinker once they get out of this course. Hi. Just comments. You know, I'm not, my background is not education. I'm working in the software field. So what I understood from this one was like, it's a teaching strategy, right? Like you have a purpose, you have a target, you don't know where the students are coming from, and you just, you're like a tour guide, like taking everybody towards the, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the, that's the exact yeah, thing. I was trying not to exactly. say guide, but this is what we teach people in pedagogy mm -hmm. is, you know, you're not taking a dog for a walk. Right, you know, you're the tour guide. Exactly. I mean, it's, it was a great time. Mean, I don't have background in education, and I was able to get, I think, most of it. Okay. Thank and you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and and that's it. So you, what you don't want to do is you don't want you don't want your students to fall off the cliff. Um, if you imagine those concentric cones inverted, um, that's what happens a lot of times with science. Is that straight line? Teachers like pull the students. They go out and they fall to the bottom and they go splat. And the students think, wow, science sucks. I can't do science. Right? And it's not that the kids can't do the science, it's the teacher can't teach the science. Uh, because they think there is one path to get to one answer. And that's a, a very big push right now is to, to focus on what's the nature of the science, how does it work, you know, and it, it, it's, you know, and I'm sure you're, you're, you're getting a lot of NOS, right? Um, and it's, and it's funny because the people who are pushing NOS or nature of science are the people who learn the scientific method. So how many people here learn scientific method for science? Right? It's here's the sequence of steps you do for science. Right? That was the scientific method. Mm -hmm. And even though nature of science is similar, it's a lot broader. It's sometimes those steps don't fit. So instead of trying to make the science fit the steps, you adjust the steps to fit whatever it is you're doing. And there's no reason it's limited to science. It works for you know, any field. I guess the reflection part is really, um, I mean, it's, it's easier not to do it as a teacher because you know, a teacher is always busy and there's a lot of things to keep up. But well, thinking about my experience that I, when I learned how to ski, I always write down, and at the end of the day, I always write down, well, I tried this, but it didn't work, and I think, well, this, I have to focus more on this, and I get on, really, I, you know, I got my skills better and better than other, other skiers, uh, average skills, and also teaching projects should be the same, I think, the ones, I mean, the more you think about your teaching and reflect on it, the more you, you have more chance to get better. And, and if, you, if you're not familiar with reflections, there's um, there, there are some articles about. But just you know, we everyone here we're obviously you know we've made it pretty far in education, and so we have been reflective. We do think about you know what does this mean? Why do we do this? So and the skiing is a perfect example. Write up a reflection on something like that. And you know, from something you, that you've done, you know, bounce it on a couple of colleagues, help you know, get it polished and everything. Hand it out to your students. Here's an example of a reflection. You know, you know, why, why am I doing this? What am I learning from this? You know, you know, what things actually make it click for me? Mm -hmm. Right? Because what you do, what you're doing at that point with doing reflections is you're introducing metacognition. And so, it's granted there are parts in every course that something is going to be born. Right, and dry, and there's nothing you can do to make it better. Um, and you have to have it in there because it's a key component. Mm -hmm. And metacognition is the only thing that really smooths it over. Is you just say, look, and you, you start out and tell the students, hey, this is no good, but you know, if you don't understand this, the next part is going to be much more difficult. You know, this is a tool for the next part. Applying the tool is fun. Learning the tool is tough. Um, you know, or however it is you want to phrase it, and um, you know, you can get the students thinking about it and understanding that okay, there is something coming after this. There is a reason for this. You know, I may not see the reason for it right now, but everything this teacher has told me so far works. 
So I'm going to trust the teacher that, that this does do it. And although you, know, you may think this sort of gets off the curriculum design, it, it, you, you can see how this all sort of ties together, whereas the implementation of the curriculum is um, equally as critical as the design of the curriculum. Um, in working in K-12, I've seen perfectly designed curriculums fall flat because the teacher doesn't have a mental model of what they're trying to teach. Um, and they look at it and they, they read off the points of the facts and, oh, I get from point A to point B to point C, and the students are going to understand it. The students have experienced that teacher. They know that all they have to do is parrot back what the teacher says, and they'll get a good grade. Mm -hmm. And the teacher looks at the student's test results because the teacher just asks them to repeat it, and they repeat it, and they all get, hey, look at this, my students are doing perfectly well, they're all getting A's. Mm -hmm. But when you ask the student to apply it and really think about it, if you're asking a question that's a little bit off that line, they're going to say they don't know. I have a question. You said that, um, I mean, students have different competencies and they begin at different levels, yep. but we are taking them to the same goal at the end, it's, right? As close as possible. Okay. Um, so we, we use a lot of formative assessment, maybe um, observation, maybe questionnaire or interview or something like that. Do you think um, summative assessment necessary too at the end or we just... Well, that, that, that was one of the slides that was a quick one at the end, but yes, there are various um, you know, types of some of the summative assessments. Um, and, and and that's where you, you want to be fair. It's, you know, you, you do want to throw a little bit of a, you know, they, they've got some sort of model, so you want to have something that's not too far out from the model that the students aren't going to get, but far enough out that it shows that they're actually able to integrate that new little piece of information into what you've taught them and manage to come up with an answer. Um, and so, we, for example, if we think of, say, a math course where the answers are fixed, you get fixed numbers, you know, it, there's no two ways about it. Um, with other, with most other courses, including science, we're more concerned with the method. And, you know, we, okay, look, okay, so look at this, you have this whole sequence, you made one small mistake here, which shifted you off, and that's why your answer was off a little bit. Um, but if, if this was shifted back here, and, and that's being fair because you're giving them credit for all the parts they had right when you score it, and you know, you just take off that one spot that, you know, and it's not that you're penalizing them for it, but you're making them focus and well, why did I lose a point here? And, and so you do want to do summative assessment. Um, you know, the concept map is, is a good idea because that that's also a direct feedback for you. Are they putting it together the way that I'm presenting it? If they're not, you have to say, well, okay, why why aren't they doing it? Is it me or is it them? And you, and you can't just say it's them. Um, sometimes it is the students that they, they just, like a lot of you know, undergraduate students today don't have the same research and, and self-starting skills that students have. They think, oh, I want the answer, I'm going to go to Google. Well, if everything was that easy, you wouldn't need a job. You know, they would, you know, you'd have no job because the person that would hire you would just go to Google and get the answer. What is that? Can you talk a little bit more about, you said, teaching how to figure out the path. Uh, so in terms of that, can you just elaborate a little bit more on how to identify what the different what the paths, paths are? Yeah. And, and that, that's one of the most difficult things. I realized when I was, when I was writing this, I was like, okay, I've done this. But how, do I put it, how do I put it in words? And that's sort of why I did the graphics, is because it's, it's one of the things when you look at it, and it all comes back to if you have a good mental model of something, that, you know, the, those concentric cylinders we saw, you're sitting way above that. And you have the God's eye view or the bird's eye view. You can look down and you can see all of it. And the object is, you know, you see the students scattered around after you do with your first form of assessment, and you understand, and you see where they're coming from. Like, okay, so how do I, how do I, how do I get them to make it up, up this path and start climbing up? Um, and one of the best things I found is when you team teach. 
team teach. So you have, you have someone else that's teaching with you. Um, and even if you don't end up teaching the whole course, maybe you give it to someone else and say, okay, I'm trying to get this point across, but you show me the, the sequence you would do to get there. And hopefully they won't have that all the same courses and experience you have and come up with the exact same thing. And if they come up with something different, don't initially look at it and say, oh, that's not the right way because it's not your way. Try to, try to understand the other way. <coughs> and then when you look at that, you're able to then say, oh, here's how I can spread it out. Um, it's, like I said, it's, it's something that's um, it's difficult to describe um, in words. But after you go through it, that's like as, as close as you can get. And when you spread the things out when you're teaching, um, a lot of times um, when I've tutored students, I found that you know they're, they're just trying to follow that one path that the teacher has given them. And I'll pull them to the side. And sometimes I just pull them to the side for one, one concept. And by, get, by giving them that other perspective, they can triangulate on the goal. And then, oh, now I can go boop, 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 and get there. And it's something that's happened so many times that um, to, to see them do that, it's like, oh, well, that was easy. You know, I thought this was going to be you know, going to be tough. You know, you're, it's usually high school kids that are you know, your mom or dad calls up and said that you know you're flunking out of the course. You know, but here it's like you know, you know, like within ten minutes, you know, you've, you've figured this out. Um, and it's I realized that well, if we take that back a step and teach by giving the students the triangulation instead of the linear view, um, it, they get to form a better mental model. Have you had the students before, um, like after a course, tried to design questions and then use those for the next class? Like, is there, mm -hmm. have you looked at student, te not really yeah. like student teaching, but um, utilizing how the students understand something and how they could come up with questions based mm -hmm. on what they know and what they've learned? Um, it's, that works with like with some of the students that really get a good mental model. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult to understand some in what, what they do. With the learning assistant program, this is one where we have the undergraduates, before they, take, before they take the pedagogy course, they've gone through the course the previous year. And then the next year, they're helping to teach the course. So these are like sophomores or juniors undergrads and they're working with a teaching fellow um, you know in the big you know seven eight hundred student courses but at the end of the semester um, the instructors for the course sit down and have a meeting with the um, with the learning assistants and say now you've you've been on both sides of the fence you know where are the problems that you've seen what are your ideas for, for solving them and so it's you know just Getting some stuff from the students, you know, can be good, but if you can do the next step like this, um, it actually really works. Uh, you mentioned that um, students need to have mental map of goal. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I mean, teachers need to first make goals transparent to students. Exactly. So how do you do that? Do you use the same terminologies as in your lesson plan, or are you introducing them in a different way? And how often and when do you introduce them the goals? Is it before each new lesson or you do it from So it's um it it depends on what your style is. Some people um are able to integrate things and make it go smoothly, um and students are able to follow them, but with most of the time what you want to do is you do want to say here here's where we're going to end up. Okay. And that's you know, that's more from like like a you know, whatever you have for a teaching style. Um, so like in this case, you know, the course was how do you design a curriculum? Well, it's, the curriculum is, is part of the big picture, you know, and you have to do, build it, look from the top down and build it from the bottom up. Right? So you plan this way and build it this way. Hmm. Do you have any major problems when you're implementing this kind of teaching in your class? Um, not really, because what it's once you get this sort of like rhythm and um, understanding down, like of, of the teaching style. Um, last year I was a, um, the teaching assistant or teaching fellow for the course, um, the learning assistant course, and this fall um, I'm actually teaching the course, um, one of the sections, and 
the way the scheduling worked out is I ended up having the largest course of 20-something students. And they were like, well, this is your first course to teach 20-something students. And it's like, it's 22 students. And the graduate course is difficult. And by using these methods and, you know, just shifting things back and forth and, you know, making sure they have different pathways and you can see it, um, it's, it's actually scary the way it's, it, it's gone so smoothly. And at some point, I hope to actually try it with like a science course um, to see if it works. But um, it's you know, and the, and the key points I think of what I did is you know, make sure you know where the students are coming from. You know, don't just ask them the questions, but listen to their questions. Their questions will tell you, you know, where they're coming from. And, you know, you build this mental map. Oh, this student's over here. This student's over here. And you know, okay, so if I do a point here, that pulls these two together. And, about <clears throat> um, group teaching or peer teaching that thinking about that we are focused on global leadership or graduation. That is actually you know collaboration skills is key of the elements of the citizenship that I believe. So I think you know <clears throat> collaborate with each other <clears throat> among the student group is, is also a great point that we it think is. about. And and what that can do is that can pull the students when they're in that big outer ring that can pull them together in clumps. And then instead of having to hit, um, hit target, you know, I don't mean physically hit, um, you know, 50 students or whatever big your class is, you just have to hit a handful of clumps at each level. And then you bring that up and you bring it up and you bring it up. And so that's why, again, by having the multiple pathways, you know, um, so ideally, like the minimum you would probably want to do is three pathways. So they would, you'd be six, um, 120 degrees apart, right, um, in a circle. So that, you know, be, you know, e equidistant pathways, with whatever your concept is. And, but unfortunately, we can't measure things like that because, you know, the concepts aren't quantifiable. But you have to do that sort of with your mental model. Like, here's an approach, here's an approach, here's an approach. Um, and start, you know, pulling it together. Is it possible to come and watch one of your lessons? <laughs> in the classroom? Um, well, it's um, we actually had our last one last night. Oh, um, we we just have panel discussion and then the students have to present from the last the next week. Um, but um, if I'm teaching next semester, yeah. I have one more question. Um, in regards to organizing the material that you have in your head, you're saying that sometimes you know a subject and you can, you know, it's like, oh yes, of course they'll understand all these different points. So how, what's a good strategy for deciding what the starting point might be? Um, and how to organize that information? It's... You know, it's, it's one of the things where it's like, you, I found that no matter how much you try and do that and say, here, here's the starting point, it, you know, always going to get students that are at the starting point. And so it's, you just have to have that big idea and just say, well, it, and that's why you keep notes from previous years and previous editions of the course is most of the students tended to start here. You know, if there's like a prerequisite or something. Um, which in the sciences, it's usually it's usually a bit easier. Um, with this course, this is the first course in pedagogy that these students have ever had. And so, you know, they're sort of coming from all over the place um, in terms of their experiences. They've had good teachers, they've had bad teachers, but they know which teachers are good and which teachers are bad, but they don't know why. Mm -hmm. And so, at this point, it's, it's saying, well, you know, we, we get them thinking about it, get them being metacognitive and reflective, and, you know, like, so which one of your teachers would you emulate? Why would you emulate that teacher? Right? And sort of getting them to, to realize it and then be expressive with it. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's not as defined as it is in science, it's yeah. like with other <laughs> topics, mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, there's a prerequisite, you should know this, this, and this. This is where we're going to start, this is where we're going to go. Um, and so, so what I would recommend is since you're doing the sciences to try and teach, take a step back and teach something outside the sciences so that you can form that mental model of how to do that. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you.